Hi everyone, Zoe here, finally bringing you part one of that democracy piece that I've um, kept talking about for oh, about a month now. <laughs> And in case you're wondering, um, I kind of got the impression that many people simply don't have the time to spare to watch my usual 30 minute long videos. So I've chosen to break the content of this one down into three major pieces, which you can think of as past, present and future. Um, I'm calling today's installment, Let's Stop Pretending Our Societies Are Democratic, and um, parts two and three will follow on Wednesday and Friday. Please do let me know in the comments uh, if you prefer this shorter format, as it will inform how I approach future topics. And before we begin, um, a quick reminder that I typically spend a few days to a week um, preparing each and every one of these to camera pieces, plus at least half an hour every single day, um, editing and coding and uploading Beat Saber videos for your entertainment. So if you can spare the cost of a cup of coffee or a pizza, or a cinema trip, or who knows, maybe you're flush and can afford a more generous contribution, I'd be very grateful of any support you can offer. I mean, I don't expect to ever make a living off of the work I do here, but it would be nice to cover at least some of the expenses associated with keeping this channel going. And also, it's just nice to feel appreciated. So um, genuinely, thanks in advance if you do choose to help. Oh, and um, I realized that the other uh, content of these videos tends to be very US and UK centric. Um, sadly, these are the two countries that I've spent most of my life living in, so they're the ones that I feel most confident talking about. But if you live in any other part of the world, just bear in mind that um, many of the systemic failings that I'm addressing in these videos apply equally well to any government that styles itself democratic. Okay, uh, let's get started, shall we? Um, just what is democracy anyway? I think most folks would probably define it as rule by the people, but the problem is which people? <laughs> A true democracy, be it direct or representational, would broadly speaking reflect the will of the entire population. And indeed, our governments, uh, via the educational system and the mainstream media, desperately want us to believe that this is how things work. It isn't. Um, oh, and in, in anticipation of the tired, pedantic observation that the U.S. isn't actually a democracy, but rather a republic, I'll simply note that the U.S. government pretends to be a blend of both, whilst actually satisfying the requirements of neither. In fact, looking back, um, the founding fathers of the U.S. Constitution explicitly rejected democracy in favor of what Thomas Jefferson rapist pedophile, called unnatural aristocracy among men, by which, you know, he meant wealthy white slaveholders. You know, those paragons of virtue. Nonetheless, uh, it's very convenient for the U.S. to pretend it's a global bastion of democracy, as this provides cover for the profoundly anti-democratic operations it conducts both at home and worldwide. Now, Oceans of ink have been spelt by apologists for the status quo, who'd have you believe that true democracy is sadly unachievable, or, if achievable, then in fact undesirable. Their desperate, grasping arguments uh, typically paint democracy as nothing better than mob rule, and they claim that it's only in republics that minority rights can be protected against majority opinion. Yet, anyone observing how minorities are routinely persecuted in so-called republics like the United States knows that the mere existence of a constitution is meaningless if it's only selectively enforced. Also, any system of government, you know, which allows a tiny minority of rich, unaccountable individuals to seize complete control automatically forfeits any claim it may have had to being either a democracy or a republic. So I think we can probably put that one to bed. Now, whilst there are scattered examples uh, today of democratic societies operating at the community, city, or indeed even regional level, when it comes to so-called developed nations, um, there are precious few democratic governments in sight. Instead, what we're seeing more and more of are oligarchies. This is where the interests of a small group of self-serving individuals routinely override the wishes and needs of the entire population. The US and UK are excellent examples, and sadly far from the only ones on their respective continents. I mean, I'm trying to show a bit of restraint here, but in truth, the American and British governments aren't merely oligarchies, but flat-out plutocracies, which is to say, they're ruled by the rich. And 
in the age of you know the Trump and Johnson administrations, it's fair to call them kleptocracies, because let's face it, they are run by and for thieves. So how did we get into this mess? I mean, historically speaking, was there ever a time when actual democracies were more commonplace? And if so, why is that no longer the case? Well, strap in for a brief history lesson. The roots of so-called um, primitive democracy emerge from the default tribalism of hunter-gatherer societies. This may be a reflection of something called Dunbar's number, which posits that the maximum number of stable interpersonal relationships that any given individual can maintain is somewhere around 150. So if that cognitive limit, or indeed even the slightly higher um, Bernard Kilworth number, is correct, it implies that small communities can, and often did, choose to function as true democracies. However, um, as these early communities grew in size, it gradually became impossible for the entire population to gather in one place to reach consensus on societal rules or norms. And more importantly, no longer was everyone in that community um, bound to each other by a direct social contract. So, in nascent city-states seeking to preserve democratic processes, one common approach was the popular assembly. In this case, all, suited, all citizens that were directly affected by proposed legislation could freely participate. And probably the most familiar textbook example would be the Ecclesia of Ancient Greece. Although, to be fair, these were only in fact open to native adult male citizens who had never been slaves, so um, convenient. Um, another feature of Athenian democracy uh, were popular tribunals. These were public courts elected on an annual basis, um, which assembled juries on the day of the trial and for that trial alone in order to preclude things like jury packing and tampering. And underpinning um, the entire Greek system of governance was a concept called sortition. This is the selection of political officials as a random sample drawn from a larger pool of qualified candidates. Clearly, this approach minimizes the sort of widespread rabid factionalism that modern elections typically engender. And furthermore, it implemented safeguards to prevent any citizen from occupying the same political office over and over. By contrast, um, the first prominent example of a republic arose in ancient Rome, and the fact that the US founding fathers chose an ancient oligarchy as their um, model for American governance says quite a lot about their innate elitism and inherent mistrust of citizens. I mean, let's take a quick look at the Roman Republic. It was organized around a number of magistracies, um, the most important of which were all controlled by a small number of powerful, wealthy families. Hmm. These, in turn, uh, were overseen by a Senate comprising several hundred senators, all of whom received lifetime appointments. Oh, how nice for them. Oh, yeah, and initially only patricians, which is to say descendants of the hundred or so wealthiest clans of the Roman kingdom, could even become senators in the first place. So does it even surprise anyone that the U.S. exhibits a very similar pattern of entrenched patriarchal privilege, capture of every branch of the government by the wealthy, and the rise of, you know, professional politicians who can expect to remain in power term after term, or in the case of the U.S. Supreme Court, for life, without ever having to, you know, actually represent the interests or needs of their constituents. I mean, the corrupt, uh, elite, plutocratic Roman model is what the founding fathers felt was most fitting for their shiny new American Republic. And here we are. But let's get back on track. <laughs> Another key contributor to the lack of democratic process in modern day nations is the advent of feudalism. So by the Middle Ages, the ancient Roman practice of awarding a benefice, um, which is like a gift of land, as a reward for services rendered, had been expanded into the concept of the fief. So this was heritable property, titles, or rights granted by a king or a lord to a vassal in exchange for an ongoing feudal allegiance and service. But um, put more simply, feudalism elevated the importance of land above other representations of value, and in turn formalized a class-based society founded on the exploitation of the peasantry by these newly made landholders. 
This particular societal shift resulted in literally centuries of debt bondage and indentured servitude, and its legacy lives on in the form of modern laws which consistently uh, value property over people's lives. Now, a key step on the journey from those feudalistic medieval monarchies of Western Europe to our present-day governments was the 1215 signing of the Magna Carta in England. This limited the scope of the monarchy and led to the formation of a fully-fledged parliament, which acted in parallel with the crown. However, um, despite what some still choose to believe, the Magna Carta didn't enshrine the freedom of the individual against the arbitrary authority of the despot. Instead, it focused on securing various benefits for the English aristocracy and did basically nothing to improve you know, the lives of those laboring under serfdom. Instead, it um, was not until the 17th century that we saw the first substantive shifts back in the direction of actual democracy. In 1628, the Petition of Right was passed by the English Parliament, which established protections against the power of the state to deprive any individual of freedom or property without justification in due process. Then, the Habeas Corpus Act of 1679 further strengthened these protections by giving prisoners the right to challenge their own incarceration via judicial review. And finally, in 1689, um, the English Bill of Rights was passed, and this was a true landmark in constitutional law that enumerated many now familiar rights, uh, including the freedom of speech in Parliament, free elections, the right to keep and bear arms, and, well, the banning of cruel and unusual punishment. And it was a desire to further these principles that inspired a series of revolutions during the 1700s. These included the 1776 American Revolution, which led to the ratification of the US Constitution, the 1789 French Revolution, along with the publication of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, and the 1791 Haitian Revolution, which paved the way towards a global de jure abolition of slavery over the following century. Then, over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries, voting rights were gradually expanded to an ever-growing percentage of the global population, and the political agency of those previously excluded groups was safeguarded from vote coercion by a system of secret ballots which are familiar to all of us nowadays. Finally, in the wake of World War II, the United Nations was formed to secure lasting international peace and cooperation. I mean, it, it didn't work, but it's a good idea. It almost immediately adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This was in 1948, and it was the first time in the history of our species that we all formalized a list of freedoms and protections that every single individual on the planet should expect as a birthright. The principles that it championed were further expanded two years later by the European Convention on Human Rights, and over the course of the 1950s and 1960s, the American Civil Rights Movement achieved remarkable victories in the face of widespread racism and inequality. So, after a global hiatus of nearly two millennia, democracy finally appeared to be ascendant once more. Unfortunately, um, we didn't remain long on that upward trajectory. In recent decades, we've seen a very predictable backlash against progressive ideals and civil liberties by the ruling classes, who frankly view any empowerment of the populace as a potential threat to their continued accumulation of wealth. The 21st century has been particularly dire in this regard. Um, according to the annual World Democracy Report prepared by the Economist Intelligence Unit, 2019 was the worst year since 2006 for democracy, with only 22 countries comprising 5.7% of the global population qualifying as full democracies. I'm sure you'll be shocked, shocked I tell you, to learn the United States was not amongst them. And in fact, this is the same conclusion reached by Freedom House, um, whose annual Freedom in the World report identified 2019 as the 14th consecutive year of a sustained global decline in freedoms. Now, there are many reasons for this, but my goal in this series is to highlight one in particular, which is how so-called democratic governments actively subvert elections to render the popular vote meaningless. And that's what I'm going to be covering uh, in part two on Wednesday. I promise there'll be a lot less history and a lot more about what's happening in the here and now. 
Oh, and um, my plan is to set it as a scheduled premiere, if YouTube will let me. So if that happens, uh, the video will go live at 6 p.m. UK time, and I'll hang out online during and immediately after to field any questions or comments that, um, that you might have. Um, so I hope to see you there, and in the meantime, take care. Well, wasn't that fun? If you agree, there's a few things you can do, like click the like button or leave me some feedback as a comment or subscribe if you're not already subscribed to my channel. All of these things help. And if you'd like to move beyond that and support the channel and the videos I do in a more substantive fashion, I've listed a number of sort of donation options here on this final slide. Right, I think that's about it, and I'll look forward to seeing you all in future videos. Take care.